Welcome back to the TMDSAS podcast, where we'll explore the TMDSAS application in greater detail by connecting you, the applicant, with the admissions experts who are ready to help. I'm your host, Enrique Hasso, Coordinator of Research, Advising Services, and Digital Media at the Texas Health Education Service in the TMDSAS office in Austin, Texas. And joining us today is Dr. Robert Spears, the Associate Dean for Student and Academic Affairs at the UT Health Science Center at Houston School of Dentistry. Dr. Spears, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, and hello to everybody out there. Well, let's get started so that you can start sharing your expertise with all our all applicants. Right. All right. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your academic background, please? You're, uh, no problem. So I got my bachelor's degree from Texas A&M University, which I'm very proud of. I'm one of those loyal Aggies. Uh, I have um, got my bachelor's in uh, biology. I have a master's degree from Baylor University in anatomy. I'm an anatomist by training. Mm-hmm. My PhD is in biomedical sciences, and I got that from Texas A&M Health Science Center. True, and true all the way through with it. Texas you got A&M. it. You got it. <laughs> Great. Working in the admissions office, we'd like to know a little bit more about your experience working in admissions and student affairs. Sure. So I'll, I'll update everybody on kind of how my journey to get to this point. So I'm a new student affairs associate dean. You mentioned student academic affairs. Mm-hmm. I came to UT Houston two years and three months ago as the academic dean, and I've just transitioned as of February into student affairs as well as the academic affairs position. However, that said, I've been involved with admissions, dental school admissions specifically, for easily 20 or more years. Mm-hmm. I've been a regular member of admissions committee and I've also been on executive admissions committee at two different dental schools. So I'm, I'm quite familiar with the admissions process. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing that. It's quite a while. <laughs> well, you know, we've talked to several medical schools at this point, but, you know, we only have three dental schools in the state. So mm-hmm. um, we're, we're kind of putting a, a loaded question on your plate. But could you tell us a little bit about the curriculum uh, at the School of Dentistry in Houston? Sure. You know, one thing I always tell, and I know the other um, admissions officers will say the same thing, our applicants are in a great position here in the state, and there's three outstanding dental schools in the state. They can't go wrong with whatever decision they end up making. They'll get a great education here in the state. Our education is also less expensive here in the state than what it is um, in our neighboring uh, or other schools, so they're in a great situation here. You know, dental education has come a long way, and it's more, I guess, today, if I tell you the mission statement of our school right now, the mission statement of our school is, Oral health, overall health, mm-hmm. short and sweet, but it tells you a lot about what we're trying to ed- educate now as far as our our dental students and that we're trying to make it not just about oral health, but it's about overall health as well. Mm-hmm. You know, we try and get people to understand that, that mouth is connected to something. Right. And so if you think about it from that standpoint, we need our students to, you know, don't necessarily like the term oral physician, but that's a lot of what we try to get people to understand is They'll have a patient who'll come in one day and will bring a baggie of 20 different medications that they're on. You know, what does that mean for our students or for our dentist to be as far as treating people? Mm -hmm. So in our curriculum, we really start that from the start in their first year. We don't do what I would call discipline based um, teaching in that we don't have an anatomy, a physiology, biochemistry course. We do more of a systems based approach, pretty similar to what most medical schools do. Right. For us. Um, There are two major courses that run both semesters that first year. We have a human biology course and then an oral biology course. So first semester for us is more about kind of cells, tissues, and to incorporate aspects of biochemistry, microbiology, immunology, histology, things of that nature. And then in the second semester, it's going to be more what I call true systems based. So it'd be cardiovascular, urinary, reproductive, respiratory, those type of systems or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, what's also really great about how we teach it is at the same time, those two major courses are running, concurrently we'll have a course running that's called clinical applications. And in our clinical applications course, what we do is we make that, we try and get what's being taught for the week and put it into a real patient context or basically get it into a small group format that our students can learn why that didactic information they're getting is important to them. Right. First semester they meet as a group and they'll come up with kind of creating these PowerPoint presentations. 
And I, one thing I need to also say, at the time that they're doing this, it's also a way for us to emphasize what's called evidence-based, you know, for us, dentistry. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of looking for current literature, the best literature, and finding out why this is important to the treatment of their patients. Mm -hmm. So first semester, they work in a group, create a PowerPoint presentation they'll do for a small group um, and then for their instructor, say myself. And then second semester, we come back and put it into a patient context where they're coming in, and we assign them a patient. So like, you know, they'll come in and maybe it's Mrs. Hughes. And Mrs. Hughes, we start off, we do it Tuesdays and Thursdays. And they'll learn that Mrs. Hughes has some issues. She's having some heart troubles. And so that first time we introduce them to the patient, the students are tracking down all the pertinent information, taking a patient history. And then they start developing what we call learning issues. What are the important issues relative to that patient? So it's kind of like, they write down what we know, mm -hmm. and now they're also tracking what we don't know, what we need to find more information about. Right. Or it's a way maybe there's terms that get introduced. What the heck does dyspepsia mean? Or what does, you know, what the different tests and things that they don't know that much about. So each session builds upon itself. Mm -hmm. The next time they come back, they'll discuss the learning issues they came up with, but then they'll get more information. Oh, here's the blood gas work on this patient, or here's an EKG, or here's whatever else might be. So for a series of about three weeks, the case builds upon itself. Right. And so for Mrs. Hughes, she went outside, she was playing with her grandchildren, and she had a heart attack and collapsed. And we had to call EMTs. Now what's going to happen? It's a great way for them to be able to see the clinical importance and it's, I think our students learn better because they see why it's important. It's not just a bunch of random facts. It's these have bearing upon their patients. It's a very so, holistic approach. Very much so. That's exactly right. And we carry that approach through the four years of our curriculum. Great. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Sure. So um, as many of the, of the listeners and the applicants know, uh, the School of Dentistry in Houston is actually – right in the heart of the Houston Medical Center. That's right. Uh, and, it, and is a part of the, the UT Health Science Center in Houston. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about how that contributes to making your school so unique? Sure, it's a great question. So UT Health is six components. Mm -hmm. So we have six different schools. It would be medicine, nursing, dentistry, public health, graduate school of biomedical sciences, and then bioinformatics. So we have six different components. And so when people, one of the big buzzwords in education right now is interprofessional education. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways we're actually able to address that interprofessional education mode is by having on campus all these six different um, components and being able to utilize aspects of each one, teaching from each one. So I'll give you an example. We have a group of students that's going over next week that's participating in um, a simulated patient case that... Um, it will be with students from the other components as well. And so we have two different cases. I can't divulge anything right now because mm -hmm. maybe one of our students will find out about it. So right. I can't tell them what's going to be happening, but they're going to come in, they're going to spend a morning and they're going to actually together come up with a treatment diagnosis, treatment plan on a patient. And they'll each be able to learn why each is vitally important to the other. You know, what is medicine contribute that dentistry needs to know about. What about nursing? What about public health and these sort of things? And so it's a way for them to come together and do their teaching. For us, it's also very important clinically because we use multiple components of the Texas Medical Center for the training of our students. So particularly things for like our pediatric dentistry and our oral surgery uh, components of our program, we send our students out to multiple hospitals, multiple aspects of the Texas Medical Center for them to, be, to get engaged and to be able to do some things outside of just the, the dental school. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's really a fantastic approach because it's much like a lot of healthcare is becoming, it's it's really a team of people that are that's addressing exactly right. health, health, health concerns. So Some of it's educational. It's finding out what the others do and valuing what each component does and what each component has to offer each other. Absolutely. You know, there are a lot of myths about admissions. We want to take some time in this next segment to give you the opportunity to bust one of the myths you know, it's it's interesting. So there's, um, I think, two that come to mind very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of us would say we think we've heard it all. About the time you start thinking you've heard it all, somebody else will ask you something that you always wonder, where did that come from? <laughs> um, one of the biggest, I think, it's not even so much a myth, but a frustration I'd like to as kind of dispel is that particularly for students who don't get in their first time, students are looking for ways to improve themselves, make themselves a stronger uh, candidate, which we wholeheartedly stand behind. Mm -hmm. 
But what happens a lot of times is students are looking for um, things beyond grades and DAT scores to make themselves stronger. And they oftentimes think, well, if I do more shadowing, if I do more community service, that's going to make me a stronger candidate. And while that's good, while it helps them, you know, we're not numbers driven, but those numbers are still important. Yes. And it's still important to go out there and improve their GPA, improve their DAT. As a school, we're in such a great position right now because the applicant pool is so strong. Mm -hmm. And we understand how much students are putting of themselves into this process. It's, nobody likes to get rejected. Nobody likes to get negative news. And so it's always tough. And we, we understand we feel greatly for those people. We always look very strongly at people who are reapplicants mm -hmm. and what they've done to better themselves and improve themselves. But, you know, we always say, well, you know, you can kind of be weak maybe in GPA or DAT, but you can't be weak in both. And I guess that's the other thing I'd like to spell is that you can't use the other things to make up for not being a, a strong, you know, candidate in those aspects because we want to accept, accept people that we feel confidently can handle the curriculum. Absolutely. So that's the, the biggest thing. Um, so the other thing I guess I would say is people are always looking for kind of the, well, I'll say the magic potion that will get them <laughs> accepted. The biggest question I always hear when I go to colleges and do talks or when pre-dental groups come in is they're always wanting to know what can I do to get in? You know, it's like, there's that one thing I can do. And, you know, I think most of them hear from us that, you know, we do what's called either a whole file or holistic file review mm -hmm. where we're trying to look at everybody as a person and we're looking at everything they bring to, you know, that application process. Numbers are important. That DAT and GPA is very important, but the other stuff is important as well. Mm -hmm. And so we do look at the things like, you know, your volunteerism, your community service, your shadowing, having done research, you know, all those different things, you know. But each person is unique, and each person has different things that they bring to um, the application process. Um, I think sometimes people think in the interview process that we're going to be brutal or we're really going to grill them or whatever. Mm. And I think most admissions people will tell you, we're really trying to get to know them as a person. It's really one where we're trying to put them at ease. And we, you know, I always say when I interview somebody, one of the main things I'm looking for is interpersonal skills because, you know, it's a profession that's all about interpersonal skills. You have to be able to talk with your patients. Definitely. I always look at people and think, could I envision sending my family member to this person when they get graduate and get out into dentistry? So, it's getting people, it's a nervous time, but to relax, be themselves, and we want to get to know them as a person. Right. So it's it's kind of, you know, nobody's looking to make them feel bad or, you know, explain away every negative they've got in their file or whatever. It's come in and, you know, be a person and, you know, communicate with us. And, you know, that interview's a two-way street. The other thing I'll tell you is also that I always try and get people to realize you know, they kind of drive the bus on this as well. You know, it's a two-way interview. They're interviewing us too. I approach it that anybody I interview could get into any dental school that they apply to. Why on earth would they be thinking about coming to, you know, UT School of Dentistry here in Houston? Mm -hmm. So they have to remember that it's, you know, they're kind of in a good position as well. I'll be less nervous than they will, <laughs> but, you know, it's an important time for them to find out everything they can about um, the school, about the program. So, it's important when you go to check out the school, talk to the students, talk to the people, and get the information from the source. I think sometimes they hear things about other schools from students who aren't at the school, mm. and a lot of times that's negative information. You know, we tell our students right up front, do not be talking about other schools. Don't be negative about other schools. You talk about your school. Mm. It's okay to have pride in your school, but you do it without, you know, denigrating anybody else. So I always tell students, you know, find the best fit for you. You know, that's part of that process. So, you know, be comfortable and really truly find out about the schools. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the, the main purposes for this podcast is to make sure that applicants really get a, a quick glimpse into how the regions that the schools are in affect their culture and their mission statements affect their culture. That's exactly right. You know, we always love to brag at, you know, UT School of Dentistry about our family atmosphere. If you wanted to ask me what's the strength of the school, it's by far our students. Um, they're a fantastic group, and I think 
our admission process gets us a lot of what we're trying to look for. Mm -hmm. We want that cohesive unit that's going to have people that will truly represent dentistry, represent our school. And I think we do a great job of it. Um, so we have a great student body. They're our strength. Anytime I get visitor groups or whatever else in, I try and get our students involved as much as possible because that's what I want them to see. Right. Before we let you go, is there anything you'd like to share with the incoming applicant pool? Yeah, so the one thing I'll tell you, and I know this is what TMDSES will tell them, be timely in their application. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not they have to turn it in May for you know, eight o'clock, May first, but be timely in their application. Get it turned in in a timely manner because as we start getting complete packets, we'll start scheduling interviews. So even though the deadlines say it goes until September 27th. Don't wait till September 27th and turn in your application. Right. So, you know, they don't have to turn in May 1st, but be timely in what they turn in, I think is one of the important things. And again, if it's somebody who, you know, is a reapplicant, if somebody who didn't get in that first time or second time, whatever it may be, it's don't turn in that same application packet again without having done things to improve themselves and explaining to us what they've done to make themselves a stronger candidate. As I mentioned earlier, we take very strongly and look seriously at people who are reapplicants. Mm -hmm. So, but they need to show us that, you know, say they've talked to us and they've done what we've asked them to do, or they've done things to make themselves a, a stronger candidate. It's always tough to do that self analysis and figure out what you need to do or what you didn't quite have in your background. And, you know, sometimes it's such a fine line between getting in and not getting in. Right. Um, they have, they, they will know of people who got in that have less, maybe, you know, or fewer qualifications than what they had. And that tends to be a source of frustration. We understand that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's luck of the draw and who you get as your interviewers or, or that sort of thing. So it's, do everything you can to make yourself that stronger candidate and, and really take a self a hard look at yourself and make sure that you're being honest with yourself and you're doing the things that can make you a stronger candidate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Spears, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today and sharing your expertise with, with all our applicants. I'm, I'm sure many of them will appreciate that. And, and all the advisors that listen in as well will very, well, very much appreciate all the insight you've you. given. I look forward to meeting as many of the people coming through as I can. If this is their passion, stay with it. You know, you don't get in the first time, stay with it. Um, good things come to those who persevere. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> all Take right. care, everyone. Thank you very much. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with us. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash TMDSAS and at Twitter at TMDSAS and at TMDSAS support. On behalf of TMDSAS, we want to wish all our applicants for the 2018 cycle all the best of luck. Thank you very much for listening. We'll talk to you later.